now, once again, Raymond Arroyo. Welcome back to The World Over Live. Religious freedom has emerged as a life and death issue in the Middle East, Africa, and the Far East and other parts of the world. Now a group of parliamentarians are trying to advance those freedoms globally. Joining us to discuss is Baroness Elizabeth Berridge, a member of the UK House of Lords and the founding chair of the all-party group on international religious freedom. Baroness, thank you for coming. Good evening. Delighted to have you here. Why is spreading this message and this hope of religious freedom so important to foreign policy? Well, one only has to look at the headlines to see the links between international religious freedom and what's going on. So if you look at what's happened in Iraq and Syria, you have an ideology that is basically you believe what I believe or I will kill you or I tax you and make you leave the territory. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's integrally linked to what's happening globally. What is the reaction? of other parliamentarians you meet as you travel the world, and why are you doing this? Shouldn't the, the, the UN or some other international body be coordinating and bringing governments together? Well, yes, that there is a role, obviously, for the UN and for the Commonwealth, mm -hmm. but there's also a role for parliamentarians, for legislators to put pressure on their governments. I mm -hmm. think uh, the important thing at the moment is that we're at, at such a crisis that it's all actors on the stage. Mm -hmm. So religious leaders, media, governments, and, and also civil society and the legislators playing our part. Mm. So what has been the reaction here? You've been here on Capitol Hill, yeah. you've been to Princeton and all over the United States over the last uh, couple mm -hmm. of weeks. What's been the reaction? Well, it's really good to be here in the United States because mm -hmm. since 1998 you've had this as a foreign policy priority. Mm -hmm. So it's good to see the academic work that's going on here and to learn of what what policy developments you have here. But yeah, it's been a good reception. We've always worked really closely with the United States Commission on International Religious Freedom. Mm -hmm. They've been really helpful to us. But yes, I've been meeting with Congress people whilst I'm here. And the, you know, there is, there is across the aisle the interest in this issue because people do see, when I've spoken to Congress people, the link between the security dynamic globally and promoting this human right. I want to play something for the audience and you. Uh, Prime Minister David Cameron mm -hmm. offered an Easter address. Mm -hmm. Here's what he said. I'd like your reaction. Mm -hmm. Roll that. We should feel proud to say this is a Christian country. Yes, we're a nation that embraces, welcomes and accepts all faiths and none. But we're still a Christian country. We have a duty to speak out about the persecution of Christians around the world too. It is truly shocking that in 2015 there are still Christians being threatened, tortured, even killed because of their faith. And in the coming months we must continue to speak as one voice for freedom of belief. Now, the, the Prime Minister mentioned freedom of belief. Yes. Now, when American ears hear that, we have a freedom of religion. Yeah. And oftentimes people will talk of a freedom of mm -hmm. worship, which is something different. Slightly. What is he saying there and do you agree? Yeah, I mean, what, he, what he's saying there, I think I understand it as what we've done as we've been in government, which is to defend freedom of religion or belief, uh -huh. which basically means to include the atheists and humanists in this, that you're mm -hmm. free to believe, but you're free to actually choose to be an atheist mm -hmm. or a humanist as well. So yes, yeah, so I don't see it as any real change from mm -hmm. the government policy over the last four or five years, yeah. which has been really to defend people and including people's freedom to convert, mm -hmm. to change the, what they believe. There is a big story coming out in the Sunday New York Times, mm -hmm. and it's called Her Majesty's Jihadists, which is kind of a, an inflammatory mm -hmm. title. Mm -hmm. uh, in it, it, it the, the upshot of the article is a new study that shows 600 to 700 mm -hmm. British Muslims went to join ISIS or the, the mm -hmm. front. That is more than our members of the British Foreign Service or members of the British uh, fighting forces. Is that a concern? Is that a problem? Yeah, I mean, when I see a headline like that, as a British citizen, I'm, you know, I'm really saddened and disappointed um, mm -hmm. and disturbed, you know, that people are choosing to go and fight where they're choosing to fight. And mm -hmm. there's a general level of concern in the UK. Obviously, the government have their concerns to deal with these fighters who've gone. But communities, you know, feel very sad. These are British people who mm -hmm. had the opportunity to partake in British society and values and have chosen otherwise. How do you deal with this, though? I mean, wh how do you engage it? Isn't it a religious problem at the end of the day? Because that is where this strain, this uh, perverted strain of Islam is sort of being uh, propagated and passed along to these disaffected young people. 
it's it's a wider problem. There is an element of obviously religious I, perverted religious ideology in this, mm -hmm. and it's a, a very extremist view. Uh, but there is, I think, the Archbishop of Canterbury wrote very well on this that actually mm -hmm. what we've got to look at is giving young people, particularly, the bigger narrative the, of the story, the bigger story that they're part of, then it's clearly materialism, capitalism, is not filling that void for them. And they're looking for a, a bigger story elsewhere. And we've got mm -hmm. to address that. That's very hard. You have to meet an ideology with a competing ideology. And do you think the collapse, the secularization of some of our Western societies have created a vacuum that this is filling for these young people? I think it will probably have always um, been there for these young young people. Mm -hmm. I, I think, though, we've just got to be more confident, and I think under this particular our, our government of the last five years, more confident about British values and what it means to be British mm -hmm. and to stand up for that, which is partly what the Easter message was about as mm -hmm. well. I think. And part of that articulation of belief as 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 part of your national heritage. Yes, absolutely. Let's talk for a moment about what we're seeing this week in the city of Nimrud, mm -hmm. uh, in Iraq. Mm -hmm horrible yes. destruction. Yes. These are ancient cities that mm. were preserved. We're talking 13 BC. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and th they've literally been decimated. Yeah. I mean, they went at them with pickaxes yeah. and hammers and then detonated all of mm. these ruins. Mm -hmm. Talk to me about what is informing that and the loss of heritage as well as mm -hmm. connection to deeply yeah. held belief and culture. Well, it's it's uh, it's um, it's part of the ideology of ridding those particular lands of any kind of evidence of anybody other than themselves. Again, mm -hmm. they can't tolerate the other or anybody who believed anything other than themselves. We've seen, though, that that na internationally the whole sort of international laws around preserving cultural heritage don't seem to be up to speed. Mm -hmm. But also, uh, some of the um, funding of ISIS and a very large stream of it, particularly in the beginning, was about selling these antiquities. A lot of the smuggling was across the border into Turkey, and then there's a massive black market in this. So that's where nations can do something about it in terms of trying their best to prevent these being traded or transited through their nations. Mm. We see now ISIS closing in on Ramadi. Uh, in Yemen, an airport has been taken mm -hmm. by ISIS. Yeah. Uh, how, what should be done? I know both in the UK and here in the United mm -hmm. States, there is a reluctance to send mm -hmm. men and yeah. women into the field. Mm -hmm. What should be done? What can be done, in your estimation? Well, I think we, we have a, a huge mountain. We left a vacuum in terms of this human right, and then we, we find ourselves in a situation of decline. Mm -hmm. We've got to get it to flatline, but it's bringing you back to what I said before. It's about all actors on stage. It's about everybody doing their small piece. What we're trying to do as legislators to coordinate and particularly to support. There are obviously nations such as Burma where there are issues mm -hmm. and Pakistan where there are issues, and we're just really trying to support our colleagues as well in those jurisdictions where there are parliamentarians often from minority communities mm -hmm. who need uh, that the the network of supportive colleagues so that when they speak out they're not alone and they don't mm -hmm. feel as vulnerable when they're doing the, what they're doing. Should foreign aid be tied to religious freedom, human rights? What we have suggested in the UK for our aid budget there's there's a reluctance to do conditionality on a because you affect the poorest people. But we have said though, when you're doing development work, not crisis aid, mm -hmm. doing development, you should look at putting in the requirements for giving money to NGOs. How is your project going to build religious tolerance in that community? To try and get everybody thinking and, and get the the aid agencies to be their actor on the stage mm -hmm. and to think, how does this project in Ethiopia increase religious tolerance in this community? Yeah. When you look at a situation, you lived in in uh, Tobago, you lived in Ghana. Yeah. Um, as you look at what's happening in Africa, mm -hmm. what should be done there? Nigeria, these girls, a year later, mm -hmm. they're still missing hundreds of them, mm -hmm. and that's just the tip of the iceberg. There's yeah. so many other stories there, yeah. horrible uh, murders and, and, and kidnappings that go unreported mm -hmm. or barely reported, except here in a few other yeah. islets. Um, mm -hmm. What should be done in the African context? Well, I think I was disappointed to hear the kind of maybe it's a reality situation of General Buhari saying we may never find these girls. Right. There was a lot of hope. You've come in, he's a former military man. We wanted to see, yes, we're going to sort out this problem. We're going to get those girls back. If, if at all possible, we're going to, rather okay. than kind of like admitting defeat before he'd started. Yeah. But then I also think the where, where the Americans have been very strong as well is in a country such as Central African Republic, yeah. which is off everybody's radar, but has split down Christian Muslim lines for the first time in its history. 
you've got to start with the possible and, and looking at how we can put together that society back where it was, which was peaceful coexistence, when it's only a two to three year blip you could be looking at. Mm -hmm. So you start with maybe the easiest. I'm not saying it would be easy, but relatively, how can we put back, help a country put itself back together across religious lines that has mm -hmm. been peaceful religi in a religious time? I, I want to take us back to the West for a moment yeah. uh, and talk about what's happened in Canada. This mm -hmm. week, the High Court outlawed mm -hmm the saying of prayers at the start mm -hmm. of business in city council mm -hmm. meetings and now across the entire country mm -hmm. they are basically throwing out their opening prayer. Yeah. Now I want to read this to you and get your reaction. Mm -hmm. uh, the High Court, the Quebec uh, Charter of Human Rights and Freedoms, mm -hmm. which formed the basis of the Supreme Court ruling, has a duty to ensure that no particular belief should be favored or hindered. The court ruled that the same holds true, quote, for non-belief. Mm -hmm. In effect, some of the, the uh, constitutional mm -hmm. observers here are saying this is a freedom from religion. Do you mm -hmm. agree? Well, no. I mean, what we find in different nations is that in terms of wh where you can manifest your belief, not what you choose to believe, where mm -hmm. you can practice that, there are restrictions and limitations on that. Freedom of religion or belief is not an absolute in the sense of you can't practice it anywhere you choose, etc. So mm -hmm. Canada is not a country, though, where life, limb and liberty are at threat. Each country will make slightly different decisions about those boundaries. Should it become um, on the State Department list of countries of particular mm. concern, then I think as a UK parliamentarian, then I might comment. You'd engage. Yeah. But otherwise, no. But yeah. Are you concerned? I mean, I raised it a moment ago. Mm. Are you concerned, though, that as these doors close to the public expression, even historical mm -hmm. practices, of religion mm -hmm. and religious expression that you get to a point where it does create a religious vacuum. Yeah, I don't, I think the way the, the laws in this area are framed, you, yes, that the state has to justify when it restricts Mm -hmm. um, expressions of religious belief. Mm -hmm. But no, that doesn't mean to say that we're out of the public square, etc. But I think there is also the onus on religious believers to, when they are in the public square, expressing their views, to be able to articulate themselves in a way that's accessible to the rest of the population. Mm. Sometimes people switch into kind of religious language that no one understands. And so you have your right of freedom of expression, but communicate well when you're ex exhibiting When you're it. expressing, yeah. yeah. Uh, I want to talk politics for just a moment. Mm -hmm. There is a huge election. Yes. about to take place in the UK. Yeah, there is. Uh, there's a coalition government at the moment. Mm -hmm. Do you think that will endure or does the Conservative Party win outright? The Conservative Party is still ho hoping uh, to win outright. The polls at the moment mm -hmm. don't necessarily exhibit that, but there is still, there's still, I think, two weeks to go before polling mm -hmm. day and anything can change in that Are time. you surprised at the slippage of the UKIP party? That got yeah. such <laughs> Nigel Farage, and he, 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 he's very theatrical. Mm. He, he's he's mm. preying on, I think, the sentiment of so many people in the country who yeah. are concerned about immigration and and mm -hmm. the identity of uh, British, mm -hmm. uh, the British yeah. citizen. Are are you are you surprised at how quickly that? That barge has sailed. <laughs> no, because a lot of that was soft support, and in in some ways, it, UKIP is a very it's an it's a classic English kind of eccentric kind of expression of, of dissatisfaction in politics. I'm glad you said that. Yeah. I, did, I did not say that, all my loyal UK viewers, <laughs> no, the Baroness. It's quite eccentric and um, and so I'd never use the word dangerous about it. It's, yeah. it's eccentric and we are grateful that it isn't the British National Party. We don't have a, a true fascist far right issue. Mm -hmm. uh, but the support was soft and when it comes to actually voting in a general election, not necessarily a local or European election, people see the seriousness of it, that this is about who's going to run the country. Mm -hmm. So no, I'm not surprised that the support is thankfully waning. Mm, very good. Baroness, thank you so much for being here. Hope you'll no. come back sometime thank soon. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you, you for your work. Strategy.